friends. The Lord be with you. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds and our bodies for the worship of God. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost and the last day in the month of July. My name is Caroline and Kelly and I am leading worship this morning with uh, Brian Lohr, uh, Sean Gladding, our liturgist Harold McKinney, and uh, trombonist Dudley Spoonamore who's graciously offered to share his musical gifts with us, and we are so grateful. Thank you, Dudley. And we are assisted, as always, by our AB engineers, Jack and John Irwin. We are a community of faith that strives to practice the radical hospitality of Jesus, and so we welcome you here, whether you are seeking a place to feel safe, a place to be challenged, a place to ask questions, or a place to be nurtured. All of you are welcome here, and all of you is welcome here. If you are worshiping with us in the sanctuary, please 
find and pass the friendship pads during the offering and use them as a way to greet one another more personally after worship. And if you are worshiping with us online today, please put your name in the comment section of the live stream so that we know that you are worshiping with us. And I call your attention to the announcement sheet. Uh, there are a number of things in there to pay attention to, particularly our request for help with the center tutoring program, the pictorial directory that we hope will be ready at the end of the summer, and some folks to run the new sound system. Um, if you are interested in, if you can use an iPad and follow along worship and you have any interest in learning how to do this or just finding out what's involved, if you'll just find, find John Irwin after worship or any other time, he'll be glad to show you. Um, I want to introduce a special guest uh, that we have here today with us, um, Jenny Shonda and her husband Mark. They are worshiping with us uh, today so that Jenny can share her experience of the General Assembly and try to talk about some of the decisions that were made and answer questions that you might have. And I want to invite her to come forward. I um, hope I didn't take all your... Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me to share, as Caroline said, my experiences at the 225th General Assembly. I hope you come and talk with Caroline and me and have a good conversation about uh, not only this year's General Assembly, but uh, possibly uh, Caroline's um, experience when she was at General Assembly in 2016. Uh, this year's theme was from lament to hope. So I hope you come and learn how we journeyed together from Lent to Hope in this General Assembly. Thank you, Jenny. So after worship, you're invited to go get something to drink or eat from the Fellowship Hall and then come back in. We'll reconvene in about 15 minutes after that, right here in the sanctuary. So come sit close. Those are all of the announcements, so let us continue our worship of God. you to rise and body your spirit and join me in our opening sentences. God has given us this day. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has gathered us in this place. God's steadfast love endures forever. There are many places we could be, but God has brought us here. God's steadfast love endures forever.
the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let us admit our sins before God. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy God, you lavish us with good gifts, yet we persist in seeking after that which robs us of abundant life. We hold fast to our anxieties and give in to our greed. We desire the very things that harm us. Forgive us, purify us, and sustain us by the strength of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Now we'll take a few moments of silence and consider the sins we have committed against God and our fellow man in the last week. Friends, hear the good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that you are forgiven. And may the God of mercy, who forgives all sins, strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. God has indeed reconciled us to himself and to one another that we might truly experience peace. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Let us exchange signs of peace with one another. The peace, oh. So I think everybody knew that, most people knew that Amy wasn't going to be here today, so I said that I would uh, share some time with the young disciples, but I only see one here this morning. Do you all want to come, Margaret, do you want to come and, do you all want to, oh good, Emma, do you want to join us? No, okay. All right. Yeah. No, you're not. Your brother's coming. Oh, I think. He's shy. Yeah. It's okay. We can all sit together. So um, the story today we're going to hear in the gospel is a story about how much is enough. 
So how do you know when you have enough of something? Here, what about this? Hold out your hands. This is hand sanitizer. So tell me when you have enough. I think that's enough. Is that enough? Are you sure? What are you going to do with all that? How do you know? Is it is enough? You pull, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I just it out? Oh, my goodness. It's more than you can hold, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Oh, I'm so sorry. You have little hands. There you go. It smells well. I know. Ah. <laughs> Here you go. You can rub your hands together. That'll help. Oh, that was too much, wasn't it? So how do you know when you have enough of anything? Like, what if um, we were going to have some grape juice together? Like, how much would you say would be enough that you would drink? Tell me when. <laughs> Is that enough? No. It's not? You need, you need more. <laughs> we would all have to, if we all wanted to sail, we would have to have a lot. Yes. And we would need more cups. Did y'all hear that? So, if we were all going to share... This would not be enough. She gets it. I don't even need to talk to you about how much is enough. <laughs> well, what about this? So how do we know that this is enough? These are the little communion kits that we use when, uh, if you don't want someone to break off bread. So how do you know this is enough? Do you know what this is? There's juice, like same as here, and then this is a little... Look at that, a little piece of bread. It is like a sand timer. It's a chalice. It's like a glass. So how do we know there's enough when we take communion? How much is enough bread and juice? You think that's enough? Enough. Yeah. Well, we know that in this special meal... Jesus is present with us, and he makes it enough for us, right? So when you listen to the story today, listen for the story of a farmer who has a lot of crops, and he has so many he doesn't have a place big enough to store them. He'd have to share with the whole town. Yep, he has to share with the whole town. Okay, we can go home now. <laughs> That's the sermon. All right, let's pray. Oh, gracious God, you do provide us with all we need and more than we could ever hope for. And so we give you thanks and we ask you to help us to know when enough is enough and, when we ha and to share graciously from all that we have. Amen. All right. Enough is never quite enough, Caroline, in the human condition. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we, we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. First reading today is from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, then verses 12 through 14. Then chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanities. And now 12 through, 12 through 14. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to us human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and chasing after the wind. And now chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me. 
and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun? For all their days are full of pain and their work is a vexation. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. The word of God. Thanks be to God. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. The second lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus while he was teaching, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be the judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, 
And he thought to himself, what should I do for I have no place to store all my crops? And then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. I admit that sometimes I get tired of Jesus meddling in my finances. With every decision I make about money, how to spend it, how to save it, and with whom I want to share it, I get the feeling that Jesus is looking over my shoulder, just waiting to see what I'm going to do. Take this story about the rich man whom he called a fool. Jesus is in the midst of teaching when a man interrupts asking for help in settling his inheritance with his brother. In that time, the eldest brother would get two-thirds of the father's estate and the youngest son would receive a third. Apparently, the younger brother in this family wanted more than, his, than the third that he was entitled to. But Jesus refuses to serve as a judge, instead warning him to take care and protect himself against greed. Life is not defined by your stuff, even when you have a lot. To make this point clear, he tells the story of a man whose farm produced a bumper crop one year. The harvest was so successful that he didn't know what to do with it all. He decided in order to store the crops, he would have to tear down his barns and build bigger ones. And then, thinking he had it made, he sat back to enjoy his life. That doesn't seem like such a big deal, does it? Doesn't everyone want to save what they need for the future? Doesn't everyone worry about having enough to retire? But unbeknownst to the farmer, he would die that very night, At the end of his life, he is rich only in possessions, it seems. So it is with God who are not rich, sorry, so it is with people who are not rich toward God, says Jesus. They are called fools. This is an uncomfortable story to hear when you've been shaped by the message that the good life is ultimately defined by what we can accumulate in wealth and other possessions, that the idea that enough is never enough. But I don't think Jesus is criticizing this man's fortune in producing a bumper crop, and I don't think Jesus is saying that creating abundance is inherently bad. It's true that Jesus is not happy with the farmer's decision to store his stuff, but what Jesus seems to be most focused on is what the stuff will do to you. Jesus uses an example drawn from the common experience of first century Palestinian Jews. But maybe a modern example will help us understand the point more clearly. You might have heard it. It's one of my favorite stories. An American investment banker was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several yellow fin tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took him to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked why he didn't stay out longer and catch more fish. And the Mexican said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. And the American then asked, But what do you do with the rest of your time? And the Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late, fish a little, 
play with my children, take siestas with my wife, stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and a busy life. The American scoffed. I have an MBA from Harvard and I could help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds buy a bigger boat. And with the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats and eventually you would have a whole fleet of fishing boats. And instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you could sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. And you would control the product, the processing and the distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal village and move to Mexico City and then Los Angeles and eventually New York City where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will this all take? To which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then, asked the Mexican. The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you can announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. You could make millions. Millions, then what? The American said, then you could retire and move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take siestas with your wife, Stroll to the village in the evenings where you could sip wine and play your guitar with your amigos. Now, had the banker been smart, like Margaret, he could have pointed out that the accumulation of wealth would also have allowed the fisherman to create jobs for other people and to contribute his wealth for the good of the larger community. But in this story, the American is thinking only of the good life that the Mexican could have. And the irony, of course, is that this fisherman is already living the good life. He has no need to accumulate more boats and bigger boats, no need to announce an IPO, no need for millions. He's no fool. Now, like I said, I don't think Jesus is criticizing the making of a fortune. It's true that Jesus was not happy with the farmer's decision to store his stuff. But again, what Jesus seems to be more focused on is what the accumulation of stuff will do to you. Look again at the farmer. Did you notice what his accumulation of these, of these crops did to him? As he talks to himself about what to do with it all, he uses the word I or my 11 times. It's like four or five verses. Not once does he say we or ours or yours or even God's. It's all his. He created it, he harvested it, he stored it, and now he prepares to sit back, eat, drink, and be merry with it. It's quite a contrast to the life of the fisherman who surrounds himself with his family and his friends. In the farmer's story, there's not one single mention of another person. No plan to celebrate with neighbors and friends. No plans to sell some of what he has so others can eat. No plan to share it with anyone in any way, as far as we know. A number of artists have depicted the rich fool in their paintings. My favorite one is Rembrandt's. In it, the man is pictured all by himself, surrounded only by all his stuff. That painting captures an old story, but one which is very much apropos for us as well. It pictures the result of our own increasing aloneness, surrounded by our stuff and by people like us. It's not a new phenomenon born only out of our circumstances. Wherever there is fear and anger, people huddle together to protect themselves and to protect themselves against others. It's true, we're worried about our security. 
Some people are afraid of each other. Some are afraid of immigrants, and some are afraid of deportation. Some are afraid of Muslims, and some are afraid of discrimination. Some are afraid of black men, and some are afraid of police officers. Some are afraid of increasing gun violence, and some are afraid of losing their gun rights. And if we are not afraid of each other, we are angry. We are angry because our concerns are not heard. We are angry because our values are not affirmed. We're angry because we don't know how to acknowledge what we're really thinking. We're angry because we are losing power. We're angry because we have no power. You name it. And this fear is driving our movement toward tribalism at the expense of community. Our fear draws us away from seeking the common welfare of the whole community and instead toward seeking out small groups of people who feel like we do. And the anger is pulling us apart rather than bringing us together. And the more we are afraid and angry, the more we become isolated from each other. David Lose, who writes a weekly blog for preachers, suggests that maybe this story is about community. Keep in mind, after all, he says, that the whole parable is started by a break in the community, the central and primary community of society, a family. One brother comes seeking Jesus' intervention in a family squabble about an inheritance, and Jesus will have none of it. Recognizing that what should have been an occasion for celebration and remembrance and gratitude, the giving and sharing of an inheritance, has instead been turned into a moment of division. And Jesus refuses to get involved directly, but instead tells a story of a man so enraptured with his good fortune, his stuff, that he ends up all alone. He continues, Don't get me wrong. Community is not easy. It means putting up with people who disagree with you and annoy you and even have hurt you. Forgiveness as well as trust is vital. But this is God's will that we not be alone. And I think this farmer who was rich in possessions, but absolutely dirt poor in relationships, never got that message. So it's about money and it's about community. But personally, what I find the most challenging about this story is that there's no resolution. There's no happy ending. We're just left to struggle with Jesus' warning against greed and his desire that we not be alone. So maybe it's not such a bad thing after the hall to have Jesus meddling in our business in our finances, maybe peering over our shoulder and waiting to see what exactly we will do is what we need. The reminder that indeed we are not alone, that we are not left to do the hard work of living in community without his support. He has promised to be with us. He won't do it for us, But he is here. He is with us. Thanks be to God.
We're going to take a few minutes to celebrate the good things that are going on in our lives, in the midst of our community, and also lift up anything uh, that we need to invite others to pray with us about. Uh, I'd like to start um, with uh, the family uh, of Bill Kemper, Pat, and her family who are grieving his loss. Uh, We know that he will be buried at some point in Illinois. Uh, We'll be praying for Pat and the family And then also the family of Anne Byram, who died this week. Uh, Her memorial service will be here on Wednesday at 11 a.m., followed by a committal service at Camp Nelson. Celebrations. We've had news of a new baby in the congregation, Hazel Blanton, the daughter of Courtney and Eric Carter. So grateful for that news. And then what else are we celebrating uh, or concerned about this week? Yes, um, we know uh, we have sister churches in our presbytery, um, the Buckhorn Presbyterian Church and Graham Memorial Presbyterian Church in Waitsburg. And the presbytery are working with Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to find housing for the thousands who have been displaced. And if you want to support that work, as always, you can make a contribution to the PDA this morning by writing a check if you're here in the building Uh, or to the church and the right PDA in the memo line. And then if you want to give electronically, you can do that to the church. And again, note PDA, uh, Eastern Kentucky, and all that money will go directly to supporting the work uh, among our neighbors who are suffering to the east of us at the moment. What else are we celebrating? Yes, John. I, I couldn't hear you, John, sorry. I couldn't hear what you said, sorry, John. And Mr. Ross, you are? Okay, I, I thought you said he's a new teacher. Oh, the Danville School Superintendent. W- welcome, we're glad you're with us this morning. What else are we celebrating or concerned about? Yes, continue to lift up the folks suffering in Ukraine as the war continues on and on and on. I want to celebrate Margaret. Uh, Jesus said that children will lead us, and I think she led us this morning. I don't know if you heard what she said when Caroline said, what would you do if you had all that? She said, you would share it with the village. (laughs) Of course, if you're Margaret, not of course... For many others of us. So I want to celebrate your wisdom this morning, Margaret. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Yeah, grateful for not having any loss of life or injury. Uh, even with the tree falling right on your house. It's fantastic. And I know sports are so important because they're not important at all, but I'm celebrating that the England women's team will meet German's women's team in the European final today at noon. And so after the discussion with Ginny and Caroline, I will be sitting in the fellowship hall looking at ESPN on the TV, and if you would like to come and watch at what will be an amazing game of football, run home and grab some lunch and then come back and join me and we'll cheer on England. And we're going to take a moment now. A member of our community is moving away and she couldn't be with us to say goodbye in person, uh, so Caroline went this week to do that. Uh, uh, and we have the recording of Barbara here for us. We just need to drop the... We just need to drop the screen, John. Yeah. All right. Friends, today we offer our blessings and farewell to Barbara Brynearson, who's been a faithful member and leader of our congregation since 1994. Barbara will be leaving our fellowship here in Danville to move to St. Mary's, Ohio, where she will be living near her son, John, and his wife, and her name? Christine. Christine. 
and they were married recently. While it's hard to say goodbye to people we love, particularly those who have been so faithful to the call of Christ to our congregation, we know that God has been working through this decision um, to move and will continue to guide you as you make this transition and you settle in there. Um, and so, so we think it's important to acknowledge these times of transition, of beginnings and endings, and to ask God's blessings on you, Barbara, as you take this next step in your journey. Thank you. Barbara's been a member of the congregation since 1994 and has served in a variety of capacities, including a deacon. And until recently, she was a faithful member of the Thursday morning Bible study and the prayer card ministry, as well as the Suits on Us ministry. This is your chance if you want to rebut anything I said or add to it. Well, I don't want to say much, so I'll cry. But <laughs> I, uh, my friends have stayed loyal to me since I've been out of my home, and I have appreciated that and do appreciate it. This week I've enjoy, enjoyed the presence of several that I hadn't seen in some, several weeks. And it's just a new part of my life that I have to say. I hate leaving Kentucky. Um, my dad was a Kentuckian and we'd always uh, uh, enjoyed coming back to visit uh, while I was growing up and my family lived here and, I, and my sister lived in Mercer County, but it's time to go. Yeah. Well, Barbara, excuse me. I want to thank the church and the members that have meant so much to me and still do. I really appreciate the support that friends from the Presbyterian Church have given me. And we appreciate thanks. Yeah, and we appreciate you. And we give thanks for your time with us and your service to Christ through this congregation. And we want to offer our prayers and blessings for a good ending here and a good new start in Ohio. Thank you. You will never be far for, uh, from us in spirit, and you will always be close to us in our hearts and our prayers. So I am going to ask the congregation if they want to participate, that they may raise their hand in a gesture of blessing while I put my hand on your shoulder and offer prayer. Faithful God, keep, preserve, and protect Barbara as she takes this next step in her journey of faith and life. May she go surrounded by our love and guided by your wisdom to be a blessing to her new community, just as she has been a blessing to us. Amen. Amen. You go with our love and with God's peace. Thank you. After each section of the prayers this morning, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will respond, hear our prayer. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in his name. Confident in your love and mercy, we now offer our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide, that united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the rulers of the nations. Move them to set aside their fear greed, and vain ambition, and bow to your sovereign rule. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure, free of war and injustice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering. Give us, who consume most of the earth's resources, the will to reorder our lives, that all may have their rightful share of food, medical care, and shelter, and so have the necessities of a life of dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Restore among us a love of the earth you created for our home. Help us put an end to ravishing its land, air, and water, and give us respect for all your creatures, that, living in harmony with everything you have made, your whole creation may resound in an anthem of praise to your glorious name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love, that our voices may speak your praise, and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and sacraments, that we may faithfully minister in your name, and witness to your love and grace for all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. As you have moved toward us all in love, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you especially our neighbors to the east who are suffering because of the flooding this week. We pray especially for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. May each receive the immediate help they need and the long-term support necessary to rebuild their lives. O oh, great love, hear these prayers of your people, including those in our extended church family who are on our prayer list this week. For Nicole, Mark, Brittany, Polly, Edna, Barbara, Sue, Eric, Chris, and Heather. O oh God, in your loving purpose, answer our prayers <clears throat> and fulfill our hopes. In all things for which we pray, give us the will to seek to bring them about for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And amen. God calls us to live lives of grateful generosity. Let us praise the giver of all good gifts through our offering today. We'll be passing the plate here in the sanctuary. If you're worshiping with us online, there's information about how you can give your gift electronically in the chat. Let us bring our offerings to God.
Please join me in prayer. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Friends, go out into the world with courage. Hold fast to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor and serve all persons. Love the Lord and rejoice in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And as you go, go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the powerful, sustaining Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>